our first topic is improving palliative care for people with dementia. If we had to sum up what the whole conference is about, it's, it's really about offering everybody the opportunity that, of the dream, the good death, to offer everybody, regardless of age and location, uh, uh, cultural background and so on. But I guess of all the people who have a particular challenge, it would be people living with dementia. And so that's our opening topic. And our purpose between now and morning tea is essentially to identify the priority needs of this group and what needs to be done to give uh, people living with dementia the opportunity of a good death and to hear about some of the good work that's being done. Let me introduce people, and if you could wave as I introduce you, you've got your full bios uh, in your program, so I won't give you too much detail. But Dr Jane Tolman, if you could wave. Uh, Jane is Director of Aged Care with Royal Robot Robot. Royal Hobart Hospital and Associate Professor of Aged Care at the Wicking Dementia Education and Research Centre at the University of Tasmania. Please make Jane welcome. I'd also like to welcome Dr Fran McInerney, if you could wave, Professor of Aged Care at the Australian Catholic University and Mercy Health, but soon to debunk to Tasmania to join the Wicking Centre where she will be Professor of Dementia Studies and Education and we'll hear about that shortly. But Dr Fran McInerney, please make her welcome. <laughs> could I also uh, welcome Regina, is it Regina or Regina? I beg your pardon. Regina Kendall, nurse practitioner with the Grampians Regional Palliative Care Team and a representative on the Victorian Palliative Care Clinical Network. Please welcome Regina. <laughs> and also Sue Peters Hawke, who's the National Ambassador for Alzheimer's Australia. She's the co-chair of the Federal Minister's Advisory Group, the author, as I'm sure many of you would know, of Hazel's Journey, uh, the experience of Hazel Hawke's uh, Sue's mum uh, 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 of living with Al Alzheimer's and she's soon to publish Hazel, My Mother's Story. So please make Sue welcome. <laughs> Sue, do you want to pop that microphone close to your mouth? I, uh, uh, and if everyone could talk into the top so we have plenty of good volume and I should good. say we are being uh, videoed today. I, I wanted to start with you, Sue, because when we had a brief chat before today, you felt that, that Hazel's death, you, you used the expression, a model death. Can you tell us the story of how your mum died and the, the characteristics that make you feel it was a positive experience? Sure. Um, by that I think we and mum were just very lucky in, in the course of the, na the way she died and what led up to it, and I will describe that. All too often, people with dementia have already, by virtue of having dementia, been stripped by other people of their humanity. They're not treated as if they still experience their own life. It's the fundamental mistake we tend to make because people with dementia do experience their own life up until the moment they take their last breath. And, uh, I'd always felt this was so and do a lot of talking and education on uh, restoring humanity to the way we relate to people with dementia. Uh, and Mum's death was an, uh, a very personal example of all of this. Mum, you know, how you hate the decision to put somebody into care, it's one of the hardest things you'll ever do. But that sadness for us was mitigated by the fact that we did find somewhere where we liked and trust the pe trusted the people who provided that care and felt like they did so with a lot of skill and intelligence and affection. It was part of the Hammond Care network of centres um, in New South Wales. And uh, so that was pretty good. Mum was there for, for five years then the precipitating events, so to speak, uh, one or two mini strokes, essentially, um, got us to a point where, well, there's not gonna be much longer now, and then a phone call saying, I think we're talking days. So we all rallied, which essentially meant that my sister moved out there um, and didn't leave for the 10 days. Me and my two, um, young adult children moved in. We went home to sleep but came back every morning. 
my brother and a couple of nephews from Perth came and went as they could. So we were there for 10 days with Mum in the room in which she'd lived for the last five years. And we had candles, uh, electric ones. No, you can't have real ones because of the smoke risk, but there's some pretty good electric candles now. And flowers and favourite rugs, you know, one that her, gram her mother had crocheted and things of meaning to her and to us. And most of all, music. Mum remained responsive to music till the very, very end. We could see when to change the music and if she liked the next lot of music we put on and some we'd sing along with. She, um, until the last couple of days when that whole withdrawal, withdrawal process really um, became stronger, um, for the first week or so that we were there she was always holding one of our hands very tightly and we'd be talking to her and telling her things and telling her what a great mum she was and it was okay, we were okay now. You know, she didn't have to worry about us. She could go if that's what she wanted to do. And we had board games and my kids had their computers and every night we got takeaway from the local Chinese and a bottle of wine and sat up in the room and had it and talked to mum and included her and that. Um, two very important features of it during this time were that the care workers, um, Hammond Care operate on a model where nurses have a supervisory role but the care workers are much more empowered than in many places to actually provide the care. So it came to the point of mum was bed bound for those last 10 days and um, she needed to be turned and washed and pressure managed and all those technical sorts of things. And the care and the love and attention with which they did that was just so lovely that um, whilst it wasn't enjoyable for mum, we, we could see that every care was being taken, whereas so often people with dementia are treated like lumps of meat, essentially. Um, she, she was treated anything but. Um, two or three times, specialist pal care um, nurses called by because this... Hammond Care thing was part of a campus that had an education capacity, so they called by just to monitor how she was going to basically validate and reassure the care workers who were trained in dementia palliative care and also to um, educate us and prepare us for what to expect. I more or less knew because I'd already had people lead me through a lot of this, but for other members of my family, it was incredibly reassuring to know what was likely to happen, what mum's experience of that would be, that it was okay in those last few days if she wasn't able to get liquids because she couldn't swallow, because that, in a sense, was part of her approaching death, withdrawing from eating and drinking, um, but that we could keep her moist moist mouth and keep her comfortable and that that was something we could do, we didn't have to rely on others for. So it, I'm not meaning to bang on but I suppose I'm trying to give the sense of an environment of family, a familiar location rather than a hospital corridor, of skills, of team, of being there, of laughing and crying and communicating and everything just being normal. So then, it, you know, there's a few false alarms along the way to a death quite often. You know, the Buddhists say it's easy to die. You breathe in, you breathe out, and you don't breathe in again. And that happened a few times, Mum would... Because it gets pretty rattly towards the end, right? And Mum would breathe out, and there'd be no in-breath, and we'd be thinking, you know, you sort of... Is this it? Because it's actually really very funny. As somebody who doesn't work in the field, as a family member, you're going on this journey with this person and the mystery is when the final moment is going to be and you're living with that. So there were a few false alarms and then it came to the day where we felt this probably was going to be it. And in that last hour, Mum was very present and a few breaths before her last breath, her eyes flew open and she was so clear and so present and so there, more than she'd been for a few years. And then she took her last breath and uh, my sister and I just sort of folded over her body and my children folded in around us. And um, 
I was sobbing, but it was with a sort of a relief. I was saying, she's free now, she's free. And my son hit, we'd had music playing all the time, hymns that mum grew up with. He hit the button for Amazing Grace. And the music started and, you know, I, I can't explain, I can't justify it, I'm not going to try and explain it, but as I sit here today, I felt mum leave. I just felt like she was out of there. And it was joyous. It was just so joyous. There was this sense that she was free and it was good. And then we had another three hours to sit around, um, <laughs> drink a bottle of champagne and lots of cups of tea, get a, a, a cake for the staff who all worked with us. And they came in and had a cry. And we had three hours to be with her before the funeral home people came for her. And that was really important too, sitting there, you know, instead of the, you know, the oral hygiene, that yucky stuff you use to keep mouths moist, we, we swabbed her mouth with champagne. This was after she died. We thought she could join in the toast. Um, you know, so I should stop now, shouldn't I, Julie? I, but I just, I suppose you can draw out of that the characteristics, the things that were there. And, and can I... How I feel it helped Mum and what a difference it made to us. My kids, as young adults now, who live in a death-defying, de death-ignoring, it's going to happen to other people, old people later, not us now, have been through the experience of a death and have learnt that it might be sad, but it doesn't have to be bad. Yeah. It was incredibly empowering for them. Um, so. Sue, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. <laughs> What I want to do, rather than go to Sue or other members of the panel with this question, I want to come to you. What are the characteristics you would note that made that positive death, that good death, it's almost the dream good death, isn't it, possible? Could, could, can you help me? What made it possible? Do you mind just saying your name and where you're from? Uh, Rose from Mount Beauty, Alpine Health. Um, I'm, uh, I refer to my mother's death too, which was... Uh, and the, the, the similar thing was that the whole family were there. We were there for a couple of days. She was comfortable and she just, we just swapped stories. We sang because we were a singing, singing family. Um, and it was just all very normal. And she was just there in the middle of it all, just soaking it all up. And I think that, that's, that was the resonance for, for me. Thank you. So the presence of family, a comfortable family. What, what else can we learn from that story about the essence of a good death, the characteristics? What struck you? Thank you. I'll just wiggle along the, the lines. You'll find I do this readily. <laughs> Diane Collegiate, Department of Health. Um, I think the, the thing that struck me, or one of the things, was the uh, respect for the person, the individual, and the, who the person was right through to the end. And that was your opening comment. I think that was one of the most significant things. Thank you. Anyone else? What makes it possible? Thank you. Mary Hocking from Bethlehem Hospital. Although it wasn't um, indicated, it sounded as though there were no heroics when a number of mini strokes occurred that was accepted as this is part of end of life and there were no heroics offered, is that correct? That we were asked if we wanted her to go to hospital. It, it was like a pro forma we should ask and I'm like, no, why? This was from the GP. Uh, why would we do that? Um, and he could offer, there was no actual positive reason. And you know, the, the home staff said, good decision. Because they, they knew they could do more to make her comfortable and have it be okay. And I think it points to the fact that whilst the medical profession sort of lead palliative care and are doing such a great job, death is not primarily a medical event. It's a personal um, event. Um, and whether you characterise that as being spiritual or not religious, but an event of deep meaning for the person and those around them, um, I think all the other stuff uh, can get over heroic or it can be there to support what is such a profoundly personal event. So, anyone else with a comment on what makes that kind of death possible? Thank you. I'll just come over here and then to yourself. My name's Hayley, I'm from the Department of Health and um, I really 
sort of can relate to what you said about the younger people being afraid of death and being in a really death phobic society. Um, and it was really good when you said that death might be sad but doesn't have to be bad um, because even just coming here today and being involved in this job, it's really confronting for me. Um, but I'm really happy to be learning about things like this. So thank you for your story. Thank you. Uh, Jeanette Moody from Eastern Palliative Care. For me, the big thing is was the anticipation. So that the staff anticipated that end of life was coming. They prepared you, they prepared your mum, they allowed things, they allowed space. So that anticipation was actually really important. They recognised where she was at. And with that skill, they empowered us. Uh, the microphone to your mouth, sir. With that skill and experience, they empowered us. It was... um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to pass the mic, if I may, to Fran McInerney. First of all, why on earth are you going to Tasmania? You're leaving Melbourne. I mean, <laughs> wicking, mate, wicking. Mm. I, I beg your pardon. Wicking, the wicking centre. It's just the job, mate. And Tassie's the most beautiful. Uh, so place tell on us it. about the centre. I know we're going to t <laughs> we're going to talk to Jane, but what is it about this? What, what's your new job going to be there? What are you going to be doing? Okay, j um, just briefly, I'm um, chair of uh, dementia. Res uh, no. What am I doing? Chair of, Dementia's, <laughs> Chair of Dementia Studies and Education. So Wicking is um, a research and education centre. Um, it's populated by um, everyone from neuroscientists through to bedside clinicians, psychologists, just about everyone in between, health workers, health scientists, social scientists, a whole gang of people who are obsessed with dementia. And um, the, the motto of Wicking is from um, cure to care and that whole um, dementia trajectory is, is our business. And I'm going to be um, helping with the MOOC, which I, some of you may be familiar with, the Understanding Dementia MOOC, massive open online course, coming to a free computer near you next March, I think, Jane. Are we doing one this year? Oh, holy, I'm not going then. Um, no, that's right. Um, and there's a, an associated um, degree program and we're writing up a master's program and anything else we can think of to spread the word around um, dementia care. Well, look, there's a number of issues I want to raise with you, but first of all, your response to Sue's story of her mother's death, what, what strikes you that you believe needs to be underlined? Gosh, I mean, how do you, how do you respond to a story like that? I just want to solve. It was so wonderful um, with happiness and sadness, I suppose. A um, couple of things, though. Um, I think that the fact that... Um, that uh, can I say ha Hazel? Because I feel like... I, we all feel like we knew Hazel in a, in a way. Um, the fact that your mum was able to live at Hammond Care for five years, that she was known and um, that there was that sense of, of community around her care is something that lots of people don't get, um, under living longer, living better and, and pressures in aged care. Um, for example, the average lifespan of someone admitted to a specialist dementia unit is 15 months. Um, so that's not a bad period of time, but lots of people die much sooner than that. So being known is important. And I think to pick up on um, something Jeanette and perhaps a couple of others were alluding to is that since that Dementia is a life-limiting condition. It's the third leading cause of death in Australia. And if we don't understand that, if we don't see death as a normal part of dementia life, let alone life, um, we, we treat the person as though they're, they're not terminally ill. We over-treat them. We have anxious GPs wanting to over-treat people. And, um, yeah, blood pressure. Yeah. So, so you don't exist if you're not mo amplified. <laughs> <laughs> yes. there, there is yeah. another microphone here, but um, yeah. so, so over treatment. One of the things that we get excited about, I think, in specialist palliative care is all the interventions that are at our disposal, all the technology, all the drugs. And while they may be relevant for people with dementia, particularly people with other comorbid conditions, it's frequently pulling back from interventions and providing supportive care. That is what I think Hazel experienced and what many, many people with dementia are, are crying out for as, as their life, at the end of their life approaches. I guess one other thing, I know, one other thing is that um, Hazel in, some, in many respects was fortunate primarily because she had such a spirit and such a loving family. 
but she also had a couple of really decent indicators of the onset of, of her dying phase. So those, those small strokes, probably some infections, not sure. Um, but that it was relatively predictable and in this case successfully so. It's not always that way. Um, there's often not a dying phase that's easily identifiable. And I'll just put in a little plug here that um, end-of-life care pathways, even modified for the aged care sector, if you have a look at those indicators, um, many of them are present for people with dementia for a couple of years before they're at end of life. So incorporating pathways within a palliative approach is just critical. Um, so I'll stop there. Well, you, you made reference to dementia being a life-limiting condition and that there's poor public understanding about that. Why yeah. is that a, a really important issue and what do we need to do about it? Yep. Well, um, yeah, there's poor lay knowledge and there's actually poor health worker knowledge of dementia's life-limiting um, nature. So um, out of Wicking, we've done a lot of research around this um, and up to 70% of family members of people living in residential care don't know that dementia will kill you. And around 50% of the staff that we um, surveyed in three states, hundreds of people didn't know either. If you don't know that, or if you're a GP and you don't get that, you can treat people as though they're otherwise well. So, um, A, you don't make plans for end of life, and B, when symptoms arise that are actually indicating disease progression, and Jane can speak to this with much more knowledge than me, but when some of those symptoms arise, you can treat them as though they're an acute event as opposed to a, um, an indicator of... of um, the progression of the condition and respond accordingly. So we can induce um, suffering and unnecessary suffering in people by hospital transfers, then we induce a new delirium, um, invasive investigations and procedures that are futile, that we're not going to act on the results of, but that we inflict on people anyway because we don't know any better and we're not seeing their condition from within a, a life-limiting frame. So what's the answer to that? Because well, it's both professional and family education, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I haven't got a magic wand or fairy dust, but we, I believe that, look, knowledge doesn't equal behaviour, and we all know that. We all know stuff that we should do that we don't. But knowledge, oh, sorry, behaviour not informed by knowledge is so much less desirable than behaviour informed by knowledge. So we, I, I believe we have to start with knowledge and awareness raising, absolutely. Could, could, uh, Sue, could you pass the microphone to, to Jane sitting beside you? I'll come back to you, Fran, in a moment. Uh, Jane, you, you, this is an area of great passion for you, isn't it? The need to understand the five domains of dementia and, and key stages. And I think email to every person at this conference before you came are two handouts that you've provided. Can you tell us what you see as this key information that we need to understand ourselves but also promote publicly? Oh, look, years of helping people come to terms with their dying mum have really changed what I believe about dementia these days. I've been a geriatrician for nearly 15 years and I have to say that when I started off I knew very little about dementia. But sitting with families at the end of the life of their loved one and seeing the extreme distress of those families seeing people who just don't understand what dementia is all about, it, it changes you. And so over the period of my years of looking after people and learning myself, I've changed very much what I think about dementia. And <clears throat> I've started to use a word, and my journey is still in progress, and I've started to use a word that I didn't use until about three weeks ago and I think it was largely informed by my interaction on the MOOC, the massive open online course, which has had 25,000 participants from 90 countries all around the world. Um, and I've had the privilege of helping those people, not just by providing talks, but also by answering their questions. And what I've learned is that what those people need is a roadmap, and that's my new word. And I was talking to a group yesterday and I said to them, look, if somebody said, I want to meet you in uh, Ballarat, and said it's in that direction, 
and I set off and I didn't know that there were a few streams to forge and some tigers at one point and some bandits at another point and um, that snowstorms would come, I would not be getting very good advice. And that's what happens to people with dementia. When you talk about the five domains of dementia, what you're doing is saying to people that dementia is not just about having a short-term memory problem. And I think, sadly, that even many clinicians think that dementia is mainly about memory. It is so little about memory compared with all the other things. It's about that whole range of things, including all the cognitive issues, and memory's the least of them, frankly. It's about judgment, insight, planning, reasoning, empathy, etc. It's about function number two. It's about psychiatric problems. Many people, as Fran suggested, say, oh, mum's now delusional, or mum's paranoid, or mum won't let me do this, or mum's depressed, or mum's seeing things that are not there. That's just part of dementia. Number four is the behaviours that we see so commonly. Henry Bradati in Sydney, who was one of my mentors when I trained there, has got a hierarchy of these behaviours. Most people are not at the tip of the triangle, but people can do absolutely terrible things. Beautiful, civilised people, even people like Odette, can end up screaming, hitting people, wandering, doing terribly antisocial things. And that's part of the dementia. It's and also part of how they're being treated, I Sue, so, so I'm sorry, but people can't hear you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just, I, uh, sorry, it's compulsive with me when I hear talk about the behaviours of dementia. We also know that many, many of those behaviours are provoked by, interac by the interactions of people with them and that if we modify the way we interact with people d with dementia, some of these terrible behaviours actually abate or disappear. Not always, and there are peak bad behaviours, but... Uh, it's part of my education thing to combat this idea that people with dementia are necessarily aggressive and all those things. Look, thank you. And oh, I'll just let Jane com to complete those Sorry, I demands. Have to, I hear it. No, absolutely. I mean, you get passionate about this, and I appreciate that. And then the fifth thing is that people die not just with dementia, they are of dementia. So they lose their swallowing ability, they lose their mobility often, they lose their continence, they lose their interest in eating. So if you don't know all that, you don't know what the journey is going to be like and it's hideous. And then these stages, as something developed by me with some of my colleagues' support, is about what's going to happen. Families need to know what's going to happen. So stage one, simple. It's just about when you can stay at home. And a huge range of problems will occur then. The problems like the man who knocks on the door and says, Hello, Mrs. Tolman, I see you've got a leaky roof. We can fix that. I just need $40,000 and it's handed over never to be seen again because somebody hasn't uh, judged that person not to have the capacity to make the decisions. Stage one is about keeping out of hospital at all costs, the worst possible place to be when you've got dementia. Stage one is about having all the medical management that you need to stay as healthy as you can, etc., etc. Stage two is when it can't be done anymore. Either the carers just can't do it or it's just not safe. So stage two is about 24-hour-a-day care and that's particularly traumatic and Sue said that's one of the worst things you ever face, having to put your mother in a home. Stage three is a, a, a uniquely defined by my staging system, not as when you're bed bound needing to be hoisted, but as the stage when the quality of life is gone. Now, I've seen people bed bound being fed with quality of life. I've seen people mobile, articulate, with no quality of life. And the final stage of dementia for me is all about, on the one hand, when people are not suffering, to maintain their, their care, their feeding, their washing, put the, putting them out in the sun, bringing in people to visit them, loving them and caring for them. They're our very most valued members of our community. These are the people who measure the worth of us as a community, I think, our frailest and most vulnerable people. But I also think, on the other hand, that when people in stage three, whether they're mobile or whether they're not mobile, when those people are suffering, we ought to do everything that we can to relieve their distress. So if stage one is all about maintaining relative independence as long as possible, stage two is about giving people the dignity of being safe 
and having whatever quality we can muster for them. Stage three is purely about giving them comfort. It's not about prolonging their lives as long as possible. It's about acknowledging what we're really trying to achieve. And I think the final stage, if we can identify what it is, and we do that when we've got a roadmap, then we can acknowledge that we're trying to achieve comfort. What's the best way of doing that? Can I ask you, as I listen to what you're saying, about the roadmap, what crosses my mind is that there's ex actually e extraordinary diversity in the experience of the individuals with dementia. And how do you inform, particularly family members, of that series of potentials without distressing them extensively? You know, how do you walk that balance? Yeah, look, that's a really good question. I was at, before I knew anything about dementia, I must have been a geriatrician probably for five years. I was sitting in a room and it was a master class in dementia run by a drug company, but it was a really good one. And I was in a room with a whole lot of men in suits and they were mostly neurologists. And even then, my practice was to say to people, so we've got a couple of people here, we've got Odette with her dementia and we've got her family. So my practice is to say to Adet, after the examination, the history and so on, Adet, what would you like to ask me? And if Adet says, like 95% of people do, no, nah, everything's fine, I've got no problems, my practice is to send Odette out of the room, give her a cup of tea and a magazine, let her feel really important, somebody will be looking after her, and then I talk with the family. And I tell the family what this is all about. I give them the two handouts that you've got and tell them this is what dementia is all about and this is what's going to happen. And this group of men in suits said to me, you'd never do that, you'd frighten them, that would be really terrible. You wouldn't do that till the second or third or even fourth meeting. The answer to your question is, I think it's a matter of how it's done. When I do it, I've got people crying, I've got people relieved, I've got people... I can see the weight lifting off their shoulder. At last, somebody's listening. Somebody's saying, yeah, this is dementia. You probably knew it. Your mum didn't know it. And this is how we're going to support you and this is your roadmap. Uh, Carol Barbala, where's Carol? Thank you. Carol, do you mind just coming out over here just so people can see you? I've got a, a, a couple of uh, people to talk to. Carol is from the Gippsland Region Palliative Care Consortium. And I guess why I've, I've brought you out now, Carol, is... Do you want to come beside me? Just, if you don't mind, just so people can see you. Um, it is your... Well, first of all, tell us your job, basically. Introduce yourself to the group. So I'm Carol Barbler, I'm a registered nurse. I work for the Gippsland Region Palliative Care Consortium and I'm the Palliative Aged Care Resource Nurse for Gippsland. Well, why I thought to speak to you now is, you believe an individual focus is absolutely crucial. So it's sort of following on from this idea of how much information and, to, and how it varies from people to people. Tell us how you manage that issue of how much in information to give. I think listening to what Sue was saying and how she was talking about her mum, um, people with dementia, and my job is basically in residential care to assist the staff to remember that this is a person. This is somebody's mum, somebody's daughter, somebody's whomever, not just a person with dementia who has, you know, um, behaviours that are concerning to other people or... Um, really complex needs. They're still a person, they're still Sue's mum or they're still somebody's daughter, whomever. So I think to actually remind the staff that they're not just a task and that they're a person with, with um, spiritual needs and emotional needs, not just aged care has a lot of funding for physical needs and not much else. So it's really important to remember this person and for the staff to actually remember that their job is to actually help this person remain a person when they no longer really have an identity. And how, how can you do that? Is it about photographs of them at an earlier stage in their life? Is it about meeting family? How do you do that? Um, I think it's about... I, I think life histories are really important and actually trying to get as much information about the staff actually to know about this person, how they contributed to the community, how they actually contributed to the people in their lives. So not just to forget them and not just not to look for them, to always look for the person because even though we can't hear what they're saying, they're, the whole person is still there. Can, can I, I, understand, uh, can, can I yeah, say can something I about that? Because I, I agree with you a bit, but there's stuff in me that says there's something else to consider. 
And that's what the stages are all about. I don't have dementia yet and I love reading the London Review of Books, I go to operas, I go to ballets, I love the symphony or orchestra, Tasmania's got a good one by the way. <laughs> but when I'm in the first stage of dementia, I am changing. And whereas I used to love all those things, now I love it when my grandson visits me and I love it when somebody brings me a chocolate magnum. And when I'm in second stage of dementia, I don't even really want to see my husband anymore. I want to sit on the couch canoodling with somebody else's husband. <laughs> <laughs> and we see that all the time. So it's not just a matter of recording who that person used to be. It's individual care means looking at who that person is now. And when these poor unfortunate families have got mum accusing the favourite daughter of doing something that she never did, it's about acknowledging what is dementia and who is this person now. It's giving the families the strength, not just to remember who she was, but also to look at who she is now and what do we do about that. So look, what you're saying is really good, but that's part of the story. How would you respond? Um, I, I totally agree with what Jane's saying, but you know, if you look at care staff, and, and a majority of the care is actually with care staff, um, who are working under the direction, hopefully, of people with a really good insight into dementia. Care staff are very, I mean, they're task orientated purely because of the circumstances that they're in. So, trying to actually reinforce all the time that this is not just the person in room 25, but it is Mr. Jones. Um, and Mr. Jones and, and Mrs. Smith, who are actually sitting together and, and being quite companionable and meeting each other's needs, is actually okay. So, yeah. When I spoke to you earlier, the thing you were also passionate about was equity of access. Can you just give us a sense of the diverse context in which you meet people with dementia? Um, well, the diversity... Mm. Let me go with palliative care. Going into residential care and talking to staff about palliative care, they still have very much a connection with people with cancer and palliative care. So to actually open up their eyes and get them to see that people living with dementia and people living with organ failure or whatever, even just frailty, really need to have palliative care. So that's been a huge eye-opener to care staff and to nurses to realise that they actually have a huge role in palliative care. What do you enjoy about your work? <laughs> Probably not the driving, but I do a lot of. Um, I enjoy sitting and actually talking to staff at, at whatever qualification, at whatever level, and actually listening to listening to them tell us about what they do and actually identifying what they're actually doing. Probably with some more um, recognition that they are doing person-centred care and they're actually listening to the person and, and trying to reinforce that this still is a person and not just a resident. Thank you so much, Carol. Would you give her a round of applause? Jane, just before I, I leave you, if, if, if Jane could just have a microphone. What strikes me as I listen is that so much care is actually being done by carers, by less qualified than registered nurse people. A and I'm just wondering, is good quality education and training at the carer level a critical need to improve the lives of people living with dementia in later life. Is that a, a target area that's being addressed? There would be few people in Australia and possibly in the world who do more talks on dementia than I do. I often speak five times a week and I speak to all sorts of people. I speak to specialists and GPs and I speak to families and I speak to nurses and I speak to allied health and I speak to carers. It's always the same. And carers love the people they look after. Carers are the people who do it. Carers are the people who've got as much inf real knowledge about dementia as anybody else. Now, I'm a doctor and I'm not gonna bag doctors, but we doctors often walk in, we might be there for five minutes or maybe 10 minutes at the most, but the carers are there all the time. And if you don't acknowledge the role of carers, I think you're doing a really bad job. So you're absolutely right. The, the sort of education that we provide to GPs is similar in many ways to the sort of education that we provide to carers. They, of all people, need to know. We need to sustain our carers. And if our carers don't know that the screaming and that the delusions and so on are part of dementia, then 
we're not doing a good job. It's our fault. Uh, and if I could just make a distinction there, I think it's good uh, to... Closer to, to your mouth. Oh, sorry. I think it's, it's good to distinguish carers in terms of informal carers, family members, friends, loved ones, etc., and the people who are called care workers in the residential care and community care system, i.e. people who work providing levels of care for other residents or people in the community who are not medically qualified nurses or whatever, they might have a cert three or four or whatever, or they might have very little qualification. They tend not to be empowered very much by our system. And it's my experience, having seen a couple of models where care workers are much more trained and empowered than is the norm, that you get much, much better results, both in the community and in residential care. You can't rely on medically trained staff to do everything. Those care workers are going to be having a lot of the daily interactions with people. So if they're well trained about dementia and about palliative approaches and those things, you get enormous dividends. Can I come to Regina Kendall uh, from the Grampians Regional Palliative Care Team? Because education and training for health professionals is a big part of what you're involved in. Can you just introduce yourself and the work that you do? Um, I'm a nurse practitioner with the Grampians Regional Palliative Care Team. Put and the mic close to you, ma'am. Sorry. And uh, a lot of my role is consultancy, but also part of our role with the regional team is running uh, education and training. And it, it, Sue's, um, Sue touched on having trust in the staff that were looking after your mum. And building that trust comes through staff who are well-educated, informed about the, the trajectory of dementia, what are the needs, what are, what are the things we're likely to see with um, patients like your mum, what's the disease trajectory going to look like, being able to inform family that this is a normal process, um, being able to recognise the signs of terminal um, activity, being able to walk the family, walk alongside the family. And if staff don't have that knowledge and that skill, that's where we tend to see it done really badly. So having staff that are well educated about what dementia is, it is a terminal illness, what the disease trajectory, what the different phases of dementia look like, and being able to recognise that. I think in palliative care, for us, the majority of patients that are referred to us with dementia are referred for some other reason. And looking back through my um, contacts for the last month, 50% of the patients who I saw in the last month were referred for a particular illness but had a diagnosis of dementia as a comorbidity. And, and why does that concern you? I think because we, it, it is overlooked that dementia is a terminal illness, that the signs and symptoms, the, the, the complex symptoms that patients are exhibiting are often attributed to another disease process. There's lack of recognition that this is part of dementia and therefore often they're very poorly managed. Uh, and then they're referred to palliative care for complex symptom management, often because they've now got an overlaying diagnosis of cancer. And you go and see the client and you sit down with the staff and the family and say, they're not actually going to die from their cancer, they're dying from their dementia. And often that's a big shock to family. Uh, they, they don't have the insight that um, mum or dad is dying from dementia, something, they're going to die from something else. And presumably it's a shock to the staff or you would have had an earlier referral. Yes, and I think that it's not complacency, but it's like, oh yeah, they've got dementia. You know, everyone gets dementia, um, everyone gets forgetful, but it's not recognising um, the, the whole um, disease trajectory. Uh, there's, if, if I may say as an outsider, there's clearly a big education and training need at the community level, but also at the professional level. Tell us what you're doing in that area, because I know you have both these twilight evenings, but you also do a lot of education one-on-one -on -one when you have a referral. So give us a sense of what you're doing on the education front. Uh, we run um, study days for aged care uh, staff from PCAs right through to uh, Division One. Uh, we had a twilight session, our July twilight session was on dementia and um, Associate Professor Mark Yates 
uh, gave the first half of the evening and then the second half we pr I presented a, a case study and then went through communication. How do we communicate with family about what is happening uh, to their loved one? There's often that anxiety about um, mum's no longer able to eat and drink. What's going to happen to her? Is she going to starve to death? Uh, those sort of triggers and how to have those difficult conversations uh, with family. So running education from the um, personal care worker level right through to the registered nurse um, and also trying to um, educate GPs as well because that is a stumbling block where you may have an advanced care plan that says mum doesn't want to go to hospital, she doesn't want to peg, she doesn't want any intervention, she wants to be nursed in the nursing home with comfort care only and there's an event like a, a, a mini stroke or a TIA or um, they've vomited up blood or um, chest infection, cellulitis, and often the knee-jerk reaction of the GPs send them into the emergency department. How have you gone and with family education? And care workers who put, it, put it near your mouth. So family and care workers who haven't had this education get frightened and think that they're going to be doing the best thing by their loved one if they do send them to hospital. So this is where the education is critical, is that that's not the best response. What I'd love to hear is examples of good uh, uh, engagement with general practitioners. Can anyone tell us a good news story? Because obviously GPs are a notoriously difficult group uh, to get to. If I may say, as someone who's facilitated many GP conferences, they're exhausted, they're always working. It's a, it's a major part of it. I'll just come to this lady over in the distance. Do you mind standing up just so people can see you? You want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Hannah Rothbaum from Glenview, Glenview Community Services in Tasmania. Um, recently we've been approaching GPs um, as a bit of a project, um, talking about a palliative approach, how we can do it better. Um, and recently we've worked with a um, GP who we said, look, this is what we want to do. We don't want to transfer people, um, your patients. And he was really really um, responsive with that and um, yeah we've had lots of residents being able to have a good death and die in their home or where they've been um, it's been good. And so it's a lesson of your story one-on-one -on -one engagement with GPs don't necessarily try to get them into a room as a group. Oh, it's hard to get them in a room <laughs> um, as a group absolutely so we're targeting them individually and it's working really really well. Thank you very much and Jane I think you wanted to comment. Did you want to... Sorry, I thought you wanted to say something about GP education. I would. I, I think there are some fantastic GPs out there with very good um, knowledge and skills in management of patients with dementia. And um, I, I work with some brilliant GPs who uh, are fantastic with their management. I think one of the difficulties with um, caring for dementia patients in, the, in keeping them at home for as long as possible before moving into an aged care facility is great, but when they do move into an aged care facility, often the current GP doesn't have um, uh, um, practising right? rights at uh, different aged care facilities. So you have patients come into an aged care facility who are then allocated a GP who uh, covers that nursing home and an event happens in the first couple of weeks on admission and the GP says rightly, look, I really don't know much about this person. I met them last week for the first time. I've picked them up. Um, I'm not, I haven't met all the family members yet. I don't have a clear picture of what what their needs and wants are, what the advanced care plan is. So it, it's often very difficult for GPs in that situation because they don't have a rapport or a relationship already built up. One day there'll be a personally controlled electronic health record linked <laughs> nationally in our time. Let's hope in our time. There won't Jane. be. I have got a story and th this is a story about the journey of one general practitioner. <laughs> I, I visited this particular nursing home quite often and the nurses would always say to me, could you please go and see this lady, I, Mrs Thompson, I can't remember her name, she's screaming out all the time. And I said, unless the GP wants me to, I can't do it. And they could never get a referral from the GP. One day I was there and they said, can you please see her, the GP's away. I said, you bet I can. <laughs> so I rang the general practice and I said, I'm here at this nursing home, Mrs so and is really playing up would you like me to have a look at her? And they said, yeah, thank you, that would be really great. So I did, and this is what I did, and this, this is how I practice person-centred care. I sat with her, I had a look at her, 
terrible story, sat with her, her sister, who was her only visitor, and this is the way I do it. I, I want to know three things, only three. I want to know who is this person. I'm not there to deal with screaming. Second, I want to know what's the journey of this person's disease been like. And third, I want to know what does this decision maker think's going to happen and what does she want to happen. So this person was a 62-year-old woman who had been a teacher, had had a family who never visited her anymore, husband abandoned her, children abandoned her. What disease has she got? She's got Huntington's disease. So she's sitting in a princess chair, she's got a feeding tube in her stomach. She, she's, all she does is scream out all day long. So the journey of her dementia, everybody who knows anything about Huntington's disease knows the journey. It's always the same, it's always hideous, it's just the worst possible. So here she is, a vibrant teacher. I knew what school she taught at, I knew what she taught. I knew the journey had been absolutely hideous. So I said to her sister, well, what do you want? She said, I just don't want her to be screaming out anymore. So the conversation I had with her and with the general practice was how to achieve comfort for this woman. And I said to them that if she had cancer and she was screaming out because she had a cerebral metastasis or cerebral edema, what we'd do would be quick as a flash, we'd give her some medicine to keep her comfortable. And that is in fact what we did. What we did specifically, I can tell you if you're interested, I started a syringe driver for that woman, and in that syringe driver, I didn't know why she was screaming out. I looked at her, I looked at all of her tests. I didn't do any more tests, it didn't seem appropriate, but I looked at any tests that had been done, and I said to myself, this woman's screaming out because she's got a toothache or a headache or she's got a bowel obstruction or she's frightened or she doesn't like having dementia or she's hungry or she's cold. I don't know, it doesn't make any difference to me. So in that syringe driver, I put a teensy weensy bit of Hello Peridol in case she was delusional or having hallucinations. I put a teensy weensy bit of my Dazolam to make her feel a bit better and I put a teensy weensy bit of morphine in case she was in pain. Now, the next thing I heard, and I liaised with the nursing home, it has to be a collaboration every now and again, and when she was settled, I forgot all about her. And about, I don't know, two years later, I was at the Tasmanian Symphony Orchestra one night and I was talking with a group of people I didn't know, and a man in that group said to me, oh, you looked after a patient of mine once. And I thought, oh, oh I'm gonna get into trouble here. <laughs> and it was that GP, and he said to me, you had the guts to do what I didn't have the guts to do. And he said, that's what I do now when people have got the behavioural and psychiatric symptoms of dementia. And you know what happened to that woman? 11 months and two weeks after that, the fa she got it, she'd been getting a bit worse, but she was settled and comfortable and didn't scream out anymore. And the family decided they didn't want her to be fed with a pig anymore. And she was transferred to the local hospice where the tube fell out and she died. And the GP felt that that was a really good outcome. And I know that the GP now does that sort of thing. So it's not just about acknowledging the trajectory in terms of not being able to walk. It's also about acknowledging what are the symptoms of dementia and what treatment have we got. Because the treatment for those psychological and behavioural problems is very poor. We give drugs, but we know the drugs don't work. We know that some of the drugs shorten life. We know they've got terrible adverse effects. It also points to the level of undiagnosed pain with people with dementia. There's been studies overseas that shows that it's shocking. So you address that as well. Th there are the many challenges to that story, Sue, and I guess the thing that I want to come back to again and again over our two days together is about systemic responses. Uh, because it shouldn't be accidental or anecdotal whether you have access to a good death. We need to be doing systemic things and I know, of course, that members, all the members of this panel are involved in that. What I would like to do is introduce you to Priya Salandi. Where's Priya? Oh, Priya, do you mind just coming down the front just so people can see you? A a and Priya is a practice advisor at Benitas, a, a major provider of aged care. How many residents do you have? Around 757, I think. Thank you. Uh, I'll hold the mic if you don't mind and if you could just speak up a, a little bit. Um, you're um, uh, very new, I know, to your job, only just three months, but Priya's kind enough 
to talk about a, an organisation that is at the beginning of a journey to try to get a broader capacity to deliver good quality palliative care. That's in essence your goal. It, tell us about your plan to recruit a palliative care link nurse. What we are identified is um, everyone, most of our staff have got training in palliative care or attend workshops and everything else, but there's <coughs> There's no one to walk them through the actual uh, implementation of the PALCARE approach. And there's the fine line between the PALCARE approach and PALCARE um, delivery. So we are planning a six month project where we're going to recruit a PALCARE link nurse uh, within Benitas across the 13 sites who will be acting as support and resource for all our staff from your GPs, nurses, and carers. And um, there will be the link between Benitas and the external providers, and also they will um, try to build competence within our workforce. You're also uh, planning to look at this issue in recruitment. Yes, um, we are working very closely with education providers and trying to tailor uh, programs for our carers and um, enrolled nurses, specifically focusing on um, different areas like palliative care, your grieving and bereavement process. And we're also looking at um, developing rapport with external palliative care service providers that we can rotate our clinical staff in, in those areas to get them exposed more on how other palliative care providers deliver the best and uh, best, best practice care. So, so that you'll have staff uh, working in a palliative care context and then coming back to you? Correct. And our staff going to the other service providers and doing like a one month stand or so and coming back and imparting the knowledge to us. Thank you. And, and your staff evidently are particularly keen for training on conversations with family. Tell us what they're telling you. Correct. Um, uh, some of them like, yeah, I've done the respect patient uh, choice um, workshop. But when we ask them, do you have the discussion or no, we don't. Uh, it's, they find it's very challenging for them. It's very confronting. And that's where they feel that they need to have that support within our organisation. They can pick up the phone and say, I'm going to have a family meeting. I've never done this before. Can you come and uh, sit with me and walk me through? And uh, most of us learn by watching someone, um, <laughs> how they deliver or, or initiate that conversation. And what uh, brought uh, the Benitez to this point of trying to have a multi-pronged plan to improve palliative care for your residents. What, what led you to this point? Um, it was uh, all the study that's been done. Aged care is, you know, this is our core business, palliative care. And um, trying to reduce the number of transfers from our homes to the hospital uh, purely for palliative care services. And uh, many of our residents do express the wish of uh, dying within the home because some of them have been there for years and being transferred to a very unfamiliar environment, it's quite stressful for the family members and for our clients too. It's a very different image from the one Sue provided for us at the beginning. Look, thank you very much. Would you give Priya a round of applause? Uh, and I'd like to introduce Judy Greaves, who's a, a palliative care researcher and a former nurse. But in this context, your mum is... is well, tell us about your mum. Mum has a vascular dementia. She had a significant stroke about five years ago. Um, and for the last four years, she's been in a nursing home, much to my regret. And as you've been listening, what are the key issues on your mind? What do we need to take away from this discussion, the action that's required to, to offer a good death? I know it must be very emotional for you listening, but what are you thinking? I'm thinking that um, these are really happy stories. Um, they're, they're good palliative care stories. I unfortunately don't have a good palliative care story where my mum is. Um, I provide palliative care for her and try to get the staff to um, do my bidding. I think I'm, I'm very well known there. <laughs> As you can imagine, anyone who knows me. Um, I just despair the lack of dignity that is delivered. Um, f my mother's a very proud woman. She's probably um, a racist, a bigot and an elitist. Um, that's who she is. She's 93. I figure she can, you know, it's a bit late to retrain her. Um, she has difficulty communicating now. Her speech is gone. 
Um, she says no when she should say yes. She knows that she's confused and she knows that she can't speak. And her aberrant behaviour, her inhibition, if you like, is to cry all the time. So I walk in and she bursts into tears. I leave and she bursts into tears because she wants to come home. And I just wish that the facility, the PCA is upwards, um, would understand what palliative care is about. Um, it's not so much the medical management. I mean, I intervene with that anyway. But it's attitude. It's like um, I was a community palliative care nurse and um, going into people's homes and seeing them as a person, albeit they may be dying, they may be unable to communicate, but to respect that person for the life they've had. I don't see my mum being respected for that and that is heartbreaking as I watch her die bit by bit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, oh, oh, hello. <laughs> it's, I don't let go. This is, this is incredibly sort of suggestive, but anyway. Um, I'm Sandy May. I'm the CEO, Don, of a small hostel in Sandringham. 62 beds in total. We have a 16-bed high-care dementia unit. You asked before to share a happy story about GPs. And... Recently, in fact a week and a half ago, we had a lady who died a really beautiful death, thanks to the GP, and I'm sure many people here would understand what I'd say by that, although my son who's 24 says, oh mum, God, you love death, you know, the way you carry on about beautiful deaths and everything, but he doesn't understand, you can die a beautiful death, but it takes a lot of planning, choreographing and, and various other things that uh, fall into place. My experience in the hostel has been hugely based, the success or otherwise, on the interplay of the GP. I'm finding lately, I seem to get the feeling that GPs are relaxing a little bit more about giving us more generous orders early. It might also be because I've tried to inculcate the senior staff in getting orders early. Get the orders before you bloody well need them. Is this orders for medication? Yes, because when you need them, it's too late. The person will go through a period of suffering before you can actually institute the orders. Yes, we do advanced care planning. We do a lot of work with people. We do a lot of honouring of the individual. And I feel terribly sorry for you to feel that your mother is dying in an area where she is not seen because I think that's one of the most important things of all. But the GP who helped in this instance had in the past been what I thought was mm, a little bit difficult to come around to helping us medicate a person who was suffering because I believe medication is there for a purpose. I believe you've got to look at the goal. What, what is your goal in these dying days when you've got all these triggers happening, you've got all these people with uh, having TIAs and everything? You've got to realise and get everyone to realise this person is dying. How do you want to fashion this death? Do you want this death to be drawn out over days, 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 weeks? Or do you want to fashion a situation where, as the eight children of this person made very clear to me and the doctor, we do not want mum to suffer. We want intervention before she suffers. And he gave me generous enough orders, uh, t uh, technical orders to give stuff two and three hourly strictly, plus PRN, and he said to the family, there is no upper limit of what this lady can have. I'm going to have to end you there, but thank you so much for that story. I, I appreciate story that. About a GP. Thank you Great. so much. Thank you. <laughs> Guys, we just have a few moments left, and I guess what I'd love to hear from each member of the panel very concisely is what do you see as the priority area for action so that that story about the GP or Sue's story is the general majority story and this story becomes less frequent because I'm a member of the baby boomer bubble. I have a deep personal commitment to the improvement of this care. So it's like a, the single most important thing we need to do. Fran, do you want to go first? Oh, of course. No. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll sound like a, a broken record. There's so many things we, we need to do. Um, no, but you've got the health ministers at state and federal level <laughs> at a COAG meeting. They had to go. Uh, uh, this is a hypothetical. You've got their attention for a minute and that's their attention span. What do you say? <laughs> uh, that wasn't meant to be rude. That's just the truth. 
what's the single what's the single most important thing for people with dementia to have the chance of a good death people who often can't speak for themselves mm. okay um that dementia is understood for the life limiting condition that it is with the associated needs that it carries with it and yes the individual is important but as individuals here we all share certain needs in common the need for comfort for love for warmth for safety for security it's not a guessing game mm. that's not a, that's a given so yeah, the most important thing is awareness of dementia and valuing of the person with that condition throughout their life. And, and, and the value of what you've just said is earlier referrals. If we get everyone to understand it's a life-limiting disease like cancer, more likely to get pain relief, more likely to get a referral. Jane, what would be your priority message to the COAG ministers? I was hoping I'd be last because then I could say all that plus this thing. And put it close to your mouth, the that, microphone. That plus... I think empowerment of people. D dementia care's got to be a collaboration and the collaboration has to be between the doctor, the person with dementia while they're able, the, the family or carers and the paid care staff. If you don't include all of those, then you miss the boat. The doctor doesn't get it because the doctor comes in for five minutes and he's gone. The carer gets it because the carer knows that the person's different the minute the family walk out the door sometimes. Everybody needs to be involved. And when that good death is happening, I loved what you said about having the orders written down before you need them. Of course you do. And you do that when you listen to the nurses and the care staff. A doctor wouldn't know the importance of doing that, but those nurses and carers, they were there the night 14 other patients went off and didn't have those orders written down. The care staff and the nurses, they're there when they know that the orders that were written up weren't enough and they're pulling their hair out. So it's, it's got to be a real collaboration. Thank you. And Regina? I was going to say empowering um, the workforce, empowering uh, healthcare professionals. You can't teach attitude, uh, but you can teach... Uh, people about the value of person-centred care, um, addressing the person, not the patient, and ensuring that uh, the staff have the adequate skills uh, to provide holistic care. Thank you. And Sue, what do you, you've got them. You would have had that situation when you had a minute with a whole lot of ministers. What do you say? Well, it's yeah. You know, put it close to your mouth, girls. This I'm is a tool. Sorry. Think of it as a tool, and the reproduction of sound is at the top. And if they can't hear you, your message is lost, and a man is filming it, and he wants volume. Okay. <laughs> um, what everybody else said, I think, just underlining that for for that to happen, for the collaboration, for all of that. There needs to be training, 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 education, um, which under the last government at MDAG we looked at where some of the best training around pal care was and look, looking at how we could universalise that, getting that out through Medicare locals and stuff. I'm not too sure of the status of that work at this point in time. Um, Can I just say my disappointment, and I'll just get Sue to comment on this and we'll close because it's morning tea, is that no one's mentioned leadership. Because it strikes me that the difference, and I don't mean to make assumptions, but if, if we need to know what this, the leader of this residential aged care is like compared to the CEO that we just saw. Leaders are what make th things happen. You can train people as much as you like. Health is so hierarchical, it makes defence look like a flat organisation. Yes. <laughs> if, if, so if, true, so if, true. If, if we and look, we have a... We have Mass stuff we can't go into with these limits of time, but the the cultures, the culture overall in aged care, as you said, very bureaucratic. Um, but then any particular facility has its own culture, and uh, that's where you find the difference in the possibilities of good experience of finding what quality of life you can and of the possibility of a good death or otherwise. It will come down to the culture and training and leadership within that particular facility, sadly. That's really what it comes down so to. So maybe strategic training of leaders is part of the advocacy. I know very good advocacy documents are, are in our materials. Ladies and gentlemen, would you give our panel a warm round of applause?